Hi, thank you for showing up. My name is Patrick Forsberg, uh, and I come from a company called Stiller Studios in Stockholm, Sweden. That's our studio out in the archipelago of Stockholm. And I'm here to talk about motion control. I'm going to try to give you some advice on getting the most out of motion control. But first, a little question. How many of you have been working with motion controls before? Some. And how many of you know what a motion control is? Almost everyone. Okay, so I'm just going to go through. Motion control, according to Wikipedia, a motion control or motion control photography enables precise control and repetitions of camera movements. And you've seen it done a lot of times, you know, doubling an actor or making them small or doing repeatable moves. Um, we want to expand that a little. We would like to say that good motion control work for Live action on CGI is pixel perfect moving camera multi pass shots with real time previs delivered as compositing software scripts with time aligned foreground, backgrounds, clean plates, FBXs, alembics, and pauses only minutes after each shot with all the metadata contained and faster than live action. And this sounds a little bit complicated, so I'm going to take it piece by piece with you guys. All right, so I'm going to take you all the way back to its absolutely simplest form. Um, shooting on a stills background. We have something that we call the nodal point in a lens. You know, when you pan and tilt or pan and scan within a stills photography, if you want to add something in front of it, you don't want to turn your camera around that little hole under the bottom of the body. You want to turn it over what we call the nodal point. And the nodal point is somewhere in the center of the lens and it moves with the camera. It moves as you pull focus. It moves as you change your f-stop. And that's why this whole little unit here is moving, even though we're just panning and tilting within that 2D shot. So you see the whole thing. And put it in production. This is for a Swedish client of ours. Uh, they uh, make stuff like sofas, and they love their catalogs. And they want everything to look as the catalog. So we get that catalog shot from up there to the right. We add what you see up to the left. The system generates the moving background that you see on the lower left. And then we just, you know, put it on top of each other, pixel over pixel, because we want you guys, we want the artists to be able to be artists. We don't want you to fix somebody else's mistakes. We want you to do what you're there for, to make the picture more beautiful. Put your magic into it. All right, so moving on, getting a little bit more complicated. 2D plate filmed with a moving camera, pan tilt on set. This is me in uh, London, yes, yeah, sticking my camera out of a taxi, shooting up a street, and then using our whole studio system as an extension to the 2D and 3D programs, we just track this plate as you would track anything. Only thing is that instead of sending that track uh, data into your 3D program, we send it off to the studio, into the big machine, into the Cyclops, Mark Roberts Cyclops. And by doing that, we will be able to have a moving person in front of that plate, once again, pixel on pixel, not having to move anything around. Only problem is that, as you all know, actors do not always want to do what you tell them to, or in, with that timing that you tell them to. So what we do is we shoot a 6K background, and then we shoot another 6K within it. And we've done some mathematics and some numbering in order to match the depth of field. So then we can do panning and tilting with the moving camera, just using that technology that you saw in uh, the shot before. And this is what it looks like on production. So lower left, we have our actor walking uh, in front of the camera. Lower right is what you see on set. And you need to ask this of your... Uh, vendors. 
you need to ask this of the people that you use for motion control work because you don't want to see a guy in front of green. That is not a composition, that is not the photography, that is not film. That's just the guy in front of green. You want to see how he integrates with the background and what tells your story. And then upper left is what ended up in the feature film in this case. Well, moving on. We have a friend, he might be here somewhere, I don't know. Alf, if you're here, please raise your hand. I know he's here somewhere. Uh, no, I can't see him. Alf did a 3D trailer of a little movie that ended up on the internet with millions of views and uh, it gave him, uh, I think, eight calls from Hollywood to make a feature film of the trailer that he did. So if you've got spare time, please do trailers if you want to do long films. Don't know, has any one of you seen this? It's been around quite a while now. On, yeah, <laughs> you have seen it. There he is, that's Alf over there. Brilliant director, brilliant CGI guy, and he has done all of this himself. So when we saw it, we gave Alf a call and said, listen, wouldn't it be cool to put some live action into that? Alf agreed, and what we did was we took all the camera data that Alf had for the close-ups, and we put it into our motion control system. Then we took all the motion data from the top of that Hummer that is not there right now, but there it is. So we took the motion control data from the top of the Hummer, and we put it into what is called a motion base. It's a little uh, toy that we have in the studio, and put it, the two together, and you will get this. So that's our MacIver-style uh, Hummer top. See the gun, it's actually a, an electric saw going back and forth. So it's, you know, it's MacIver style all the way. That's what we saw uh, shooting it, and that is what Alf comped together. So, I mean, by getting all these tools and by knowing what you're doing and by having all the data going into the studio, you can start play around. You can do things, you know, not possible before. And, I mean, even though I love my toys, it's yes toys, it's yes technology, it's there for you to tell a story in the best way possible. And it's there for you to, you know, break out of all the limitations that uh, physical locations might give you. You want to use this if you shoot, let's say, out in space, somewhere where you can't get in, a place where they won't let you shoot, a place that is too expensive to, to rent, or a place that does not longer exist. Moving on from there, there are a little, you know, we have a b bunch of behind the scenes on the website that I'm going to show you later on. If you want to go in and have a look at it, please do. Um, Alf being from Norway, we had a couple of other friends from Norway who, who uh, didn't believe us when we said we could put, you know, pixel on pixel, because that's not what uh, motion control is known for. Motion control used to be known for being a slow process where you get one shot today if you're lucky, and once you get it, it's moving around like this. We take pride in shooting the same speed as if it was real live action and to give it back to you pixel on pixel, and that's what you should ask for. Anyways, in this case, we have this dinosaur. We take the data from the neck of the di uh, dinosaur, and then we also take the data from the camera. If you look at the grid down there, you see it's a moving camera, moving around the dinosaur, and you also see that the dinosaur is moving around. So we have two streams of data. One, we send off to the camera or to the motion control itself, holding the camera. The other stream, we send off to the motion base, and you get something looking like this, shooting it. So that's just the actor is sitting on top of that little unit, getting that right information, and then putting them on top of each other. This is what you get, straight out of the box, raw. It's pixel on pixel, and it's there for you to be good. It's there because we don't want you to, you know, post-track things and move them around or fake something that works. We want you to be artists. We want you, and having said that, don't look too much at our comps because we're not here to show off as compers. That's your job. We send off pixel on pixel work for the guys we work with. All right, um, moving on. This is interesting. This is us shooting inside a total 3D world. Just imagine, you know, having a 3D world like a game engine or a game set, 
and use it as uh, your set. Instead of building in wood and plaster, you can build in zeros and ones and you know, have your whole set, digital set. So this is from a series of uh, kids movies that we made. Lower left is very crude 3D. It's just there to tell the director and the director of photography where we are. Lower right is what we shot on set. Center up there is what we get out to edit our offline. And then moving on from there, this is what we get. This is from the actual film. And what is interesting here, I think, is no tracking markers. No tracking markers at all. You need to trust your system. You need to trust the stuff you're working with. So you need to do tests, tests, tests with the company you're working with to make sure that when you're on set, you're going to trust the system as much as you trust your DOP or your director or your gaffer or whoever. Um, in a little while, I'm going to hook us up to Stockholm, straight to the studio over there, and we're going to do some directing live. But before we do that, I would like to take the opportunity to once again enhance the importance of fixing it in pre. Whenever you hear someone on set say, no, we fixed that in post, you hear them say, this is going to be expensive. And I mean, since all of you guys know this, you are the ones who know how it works. I was a director myself in the beginning. I was one of the worst. I was one of the guys, you know, going, nah, doesn't matter, we fix that later. Let's shoot, shoot, shoot. And I ended up with shit. It didn't look good. And after a while, I learned to, you know, if I take five minutes on set to set it up properly, if I give my guys that extra five minutes to make sure everything works, they're going to give me better material. I'm going to look better after. It's as simple as that. And it's really, really weird how people like myself could, you know, have missed that. Because by stressing on set, I look bad after. So remember, shooting with motion control is telling your producer to give you time with the people that you're going to be working with and give you time on set. So that's Fix It In Pre. We have a little tool for that. It's a tool we built so that we can take any material, basically, and uh, bring it into our system, take the data, just add our studio, and then send the data back the way it looked when we got it, just our data added to it, the 2D plates added to it. And I think that's important too. When you talk to your motion control people, make sure that the data you send them come back in the same format. Because there is a possibility that they will take your data, they will transform it into something else that works with the motion control, and they will send back stuff that you won't understand. So make sure that whatever data you send to them, they send to you. All right, we do some high-speed work as well. Uh, this is once again Mark Roberts. Uh, this, in this case, it's something called the Bolt. It's a high-speed motion control. Uh, and we've all seen a lot of high-speed material. But if you get that high-speed camera to move, it's going to look more interesting. And if you get that high-speed camera to move in a way where you can pull out the information and the data of how it's moving, you're going to be able to add backgrounds. You're going to be able to add CGI to it. And it's going to be a simple process, even though it's very complicated. And it's going to make you look better. Like in this case, for example, the bullet. We heated the bullet, bullet up there. So when it drops down in that little puddle, it's going to be, be smoke all, all over the place. All right, so I'm going to move on from here. And if you want to have a look at this, please go ahead, look at the website. There is also a behind the scenes coming up here. It's incredible. This has gotten 10 million views for some reason. It's just a little demo that we did. But it's, I think it's because it's fun toys, and they're available to you now. I mean, back in the days, these were toys available only to the really, really, really big budget Hollywood productions. If you do a commercial today, if you do a medium budget uh, feature film today, these toys are available. They're not super, super, super expensive anymore. They're just expensive. Anyone recognize this? Hands up. Someone recognizes? Yes, thank you. It is a guy called uh, Andrew who runs uh, a place that you must know. Video Copilot. Who knows Video Copilot? Good. Fantastic people and very, 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 you know, well incorporated in the uh, 
Adobe and After Effects world. So we thought that for today we wanted to do a new production. So I was here yesterday and Thursday we did some work for you guys to see what one day could look like when we play around. So we took uh, the background here. Unfortunately, Andrew couldn't give us the truck, but we took his project, we took his plate, this one, and you've probably seen it before. I don't know if it's him shooting, might be. But anyways, what you see is a handheld camera moving. And if you want to put someone in there, you need to have a camera that's replicating that move exactly. Because otherwise you will see feet all over the place. And you don't want that because that's going to look fake and we don't want stuff to look fake. We want it to look good. So what did we do? We brought in another one of his uh, assets, an A-bomb from uh, Motion Design 2. And then we uh, brought in a little kid. So the A-bomb is really easy. You've probably been doing this before. I mean, it's just tracking, put it in there, and then, oh, well, it's not easy. It's really, really complicated, but it's stuff that's been done. But bringing in a person is very complicated. You need to, I mean, if you look at her feet as she runs, they're spot on. And it's good that she's behind the pillar if something happens, I think. But moving on, this is what it looks like when we shoot it. It's really, really simple. It's just, you know, a little apple box in there for her to ste step on that bomb. It's a little green pillar instead, instead of the gray one. And uh, if we move on from here, this is what it looks like side by side. And what you see on the floor is not tracking markers. It's actually markers for her to know where to run. So running up to that one, she knows that she has to run between the two, but she doesn't. Told you before, actors don't always do what you tell them to. Um, another one that we did with Andrew stuff, Motion Design 2 and Jet Strike, another package that he's got out. Uh, we built this little hangar and we took his, uh, I don't know if it's an F-16 or anyone knows about airplanes in here? It's an airplane that I know. Uh, so we had our little girl walking up the ladder and then just, you know, stealing the airplane and flying away, leaving the place. And once again, the same thing here. I want this to be pixel on pixel. We had less than a day to comp it, so we can't be playing around with, you know, putting stuff, moving it all over, and pre-track it, and try to make it work or anything. No, we just went into the studio, we shot it against green, make sure that the uh, 3D ladder is bigger than our ladder because it has to cover it, have the girl climb up, climb in to the so-called cockpit, sit down, and then we lift off. And then we have the camera just tilt down, down to simulate her flying out of frame. So side by side, this is what it looks like. And off we go. So that's how simple it should be when you work with motion control. That's what you want back. Because once again, as a VFX artist, you want one layer, you want to put it on top of the other layer, and you want to make your magic. Okay, so not many people believe me when I talk about this. And because of that, I'm gonna call up Stockholm. Fingers crossed, this is very brave of me, I think, because things can happen. I'm going to call up Stockholm and we're going to change our view. I've got Stockholm on, ah, uh, oh, there it is. And I'm going to see if they're there to answer me. Please. There he is. See, that's Thomas down to the left in that little window. Thomas, can you wave to them? That's Thomas. If you wave back, please, he won't see you. 
but, <laughs> but I want to see that. Hang on, I'm going to... Please wave to Thomas, all of you. All right, there we go. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is the studio in Stockholm. Thomas is there. Another Thomas is out. <laughs> He's got the gun today. <laughs> all right. Okay, so what we see here is a game engine. Uh, anyone knows of the game engine called Epic Unreal? Anyone been working with Epic Unreal? Okay, so you know what it is. It's a real-time game engine where you can get you know, lighting information, you can be playing around in real time. And that's good when you do motion control, because you want to be able to light your foreground, your real live action material. You want to light it so that it works with the background. Need one more. There we go. Uh, okay, so if Thomas starts moving the motion control so that we can see it, can you move it into frame, please, Thomas, so that we can see it? There it goes. Ah, oh, we're on a little bit slow internet here. I don't know if any of you guys have slow internet. I do. <laughs> no, they're getting, giving me quite, quite fast. Can you move it in so we can see the whole thing, Thomas? Oh, thank you. Can you move it into frame so that we can see the motion control piece? There it is. Okay, so that's the Mark Roberts Cyclops. It's six and a half meters up, four and a half meters out to the sides. It weighs 4.6 tons, and you can talk to them about it in, booth, in, in, in their booth over in, in Hall 11. But now I'm going to be directing. This is a fantastic tool. We have had people directing us all the way from Brazil with this tool. Uh, and it's good because Sweden is far, far away, and not many people want to go there. So it's, you know something that we invented. It's also good because I can be here directing, and I believe that I could even be, you know, on. Bahamas or going off to Mallorca or something and work from there. Anyways, I'm going to ask them to... Uh, has he got two guns now? Yes, he has. <laughs> All right. So let's make this, let's make this uh, shot. Uh, can we line up? Uh, Thomas with the guns, can you go up? Stand far away from the camera, please. And then... Uh, Something is going to come up in frame now. It's a blue light. It's going to give us an optical uh, code. It's there because we don't know what is the first frame when we shoot something. Uh, if you've been working with digital cameras, you know that when you press that button, you don't know if you're on zero, minus one, or plus one, because it depends on where the sector is. We have this optical tool, so we can always line up our projects. And you need to ask that from your vendors too. You don't want to be messing around, fixing the files. You want a bunch of files that you just put into your machine and start comping. Anyways, we're going to go, uh, all right, so let's roll camera, please. There it is, and action. Okay, very tough guy walking towards camera. Camera moving back. This could be a super hit, and thank you. All right, so now we just shot this, and I'm going to switch interface in a second, but first I'm going to show you what this interface can do. need to put my glasses on. First of all, we can see a bunch of different surveillance cameras from the studio in here, so we can see everything from different directions. We also have, uh, hopefully, our shot, there it is. So that's the shot we just took. And it's immediately downloadable, and you can start working on it immediately. But then if we switch to uh, our FTP, I'm just going to log in. And I'm going to say thank you to the guys in Stockholm. Thanks a lot. Bye, Thomas. Okay, so uh, if we open up this one, 1524 says that I only have six minutes to go. But opening it, we have all the information we need to make a big comp, to be VFX post-production superstars, because that's what we want to be. We have 
from the top, the alembics, we have the FBXs, we have the job file, which is the uh, file that tells the motion control what it's doing. We have the XYZ file, it's one XYZ point here, one, X one XYZ point there. The reason we have all these different systems is so that we can work with all different systems. Then we have our proxies, we have background proxies, foreground proxies, and we also have the pre comped proxy that you just saw. And on top of that, we have all the roof, co roof cams. Roof cams are good to have because you want to know what happens outside what the camera sees. You want to know where were the lights when I was shooting? What happened on the sides? How can I make this look good after? And yes, that is uh, the studio view. So if we could go back to the uh, Mac again, please. Thank you. So this is what I try to tell people, you know, that I work with. Fix it in pre, that's where you want to fix stuff. Know the limitations of the system. The unit weighs six, no, oh, sorry, 4.6 tons. It can't just start moving like that. It takes a while. Test, test, test. Make sure that all the data is preserved and make sure that the motion control is super calibrated. And most important of all, have fun doing it. And if you want to see any of this material, please go into stillestudios.com. My name is Patrick, and I thank you very much for being here. Thanks a lot.